No, I was talking sound booth, sorry. I'm ready too. You're ready too? I like that. You see, yeah. You're you're sixty how much and your mom's still having to quiet you in church? <laughs> she probably has a spatula in that purse if you don't watch out. But let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for uh, all the folks that are gathered here today. We ask that your hand would be on everyone that is traveling this week, Lord. It's a, it's a huge vacation holiday week and weekend that's coming up. And, and Lord, we ask that your hand would be upon uh, our county and our state as we're under these, these drought conditions. But we're going to have uh, a celebration of our independence, Father. And so, um, Lord, protect the firefighters, protect the fields, protect... Uh, Let's protect stupid people, Lord, because let's face it, there's a lot of us. And I thank you for all that you're doing here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, yeah, uh, my brain just fried, sorry. Um, Monday, I, I think lineup is at 9.30. Uh, we will be having a float in the, in the Independence Day parade. And so it's not just for kids. If you would like to ride the float with the kids, come on out and ride the float. Um, it's going to be a very simple float this year. We're, uh, uh, you know, giant flag, and everyone's going to have smaller flags, and, um, you know, basically your patriotic red, white, and blue th theme thing. Um, we were going to do, and Miss Reagan actually bought the tricorn hats and everything else for that. We were going to do the whole uh, patriot thing, and we were going to have the independence marchers with the, with the crutch and all that, um, but we just didn't get everything organized the way we wanted to in time. Um, just because Miss Reagan's not been feeling so well. So uh, we didn't get it entirely done the way we wanted to. But, uh, um, and again, pray for everybody that's on. I, I got like, you know, 12 or, or 13 text messages in the last two days going, hey, Pastor, I'm not going to be there tonight. I'm not going to be there on Wednesday, uh, Sunday because it's a holiday weekend. And so the smart people took their vacation, backed up against it, because then they don't have to come back to work on Monday. They can wait till Tuesday, and it extended their vacation time. So a lot of folks are, are vacationing this day. Um, and so uh, uh, just keep everybody in prayer as they travel. And uh, the fire uh, danger out there is huge right now. Um, every day the fire department gets more and more notifications from the state about drought conditions and everything and and like marlin it, i don't know what happened with marlin but two days ago they got like three inches of rain nobody else around us got the rain but man they just got drowned in marlin um i went there today and there's like mud puddles this deep and stuff in places still and and uh i'm like yeah it, it rained dust here um you know i go out there every day okay now this you know, not being a native texan maybe y'all can help me um I, i've got those trees in my front yard with the flowers on them what do I think? Myrtles. Crepe myrtles, thank you. And they are shedding water of some sort. What, what is that? That's normal. That's, that's normal. Okay, well, it's really messing up the windows on my vehicles. That's, you know, um, very, very sticky. Yeah. Yeah. It take the paint off the cars. Well, that's, that's awesome. Um, I got the Jeep parked over there right now, and I'm planning on rhino lining the whole Jeep at some point anyway, so I'm not too worried about that. But... Uh, uh, my truck is now out of windshield wiper stuff because every day it's just... And you stand there and you actually get wet standing underneath the tree, which is actually kind of nice when you think about it, but uh, then you're sticky too, so it's not so nice. Um, but anyway, all right. Um, the, we are still doing the question and answer uh, format for Wednesday nights. That will change towards the end of July when we bring in the new Bible study program that we're going to be running. The, the, uh, so I, um, we're still under the same thing that we've been doing, and I have several questions um, that have come in over the week. Uh, Sunday, if you remember, I started out Sunday's message by saying I really didn't want to address the abortion issue, and so I just gave my brief spiel on it, and then I went into the sermon that I had planned for several weeks that it turned out really kind of addressed a lot of the issues surrounding the abortion issue, and that just shows you that God is smarter than me, um, because, you know, that's what he put on my heart to preach uh, for this week. And, and even the night before when I was just doing the polishing stuff, it really didn't hit me how much it addressed a lot of the, the, the topics and issues there. And so um, I wanted to, you know, that, that was not my intent, but it, it worked out very well because he knew what was going on rather than me knowing what was going on. Um, but I've been asked by about six different questions about Numbers chapter 5. And so I'm going to read Numbers chapter 5 to you, and then we're going to address it um, in, in the context of the questions people have been asking. So it, it's a little bit lengthy, and you all know I don't read that great, so um, please forgive me. 
Uh, anyway, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper and everyone who has been discharged, uh, whoever becomes defiled by a corpse. Okay, this isn't what... Let me scoot down a little bit. Okay, starting in like verse 6, it says, Speak to the children of Israel. When a man or a woman commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against the Lord... Uh, and that person is guilty, then they shall confess that sin which he has committed, and, and he shall make restitution for his trespass in full, plus one-fifth, so 20% interest, and, and give it to the one that he's wronged. But if the man has no relative to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution for the wrong must go into the Lord uh, for the priests, in addition to the ram of atonement with, which is made for each one. Every offering of the holy thing of the children of Israel, which they bring to the priest, shall also be his. Okay, I'm trying to get to the part that I keep getting asked about, but I want to make sure that we're in context here. Um, okay, yeah, here we go. Skipping over to verse 12. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and behaves unfaithfully towards him, a man lies with her and car carnally, and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband, and it is concealed that she has defiled herself, then there is no witness against her, nor was she caught. If the spirit of jealousy comes upon him, he becomes jealous of his wife, so who has defiled herself, or if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife, although she has not defiled herself, then the man shall bring his wife to the priests. He shall bring an offering required for her, one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal, and, and he shall pour no oil on it and put no frankincense on it, because it is a grain offering of jealousy, an offering to remember for bringing iniquity to, be, uh, to remembrance." And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel and take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it in the water. Um, and this, there's several questions that are being asked. One about the whole passage. Some of it's about holy water. So we're going to have to cover several topics through this, okay? Then the priest shall stand before the woman and the Lord uncovered the woman's head and put... Um, the offering of remembrance in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy, and the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that brings a curse. And the priest shall put un, uh, her under oath to say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray in un uncleanness while you were under the husband's authority, be free from this bitter water and that brings a curse. But if you have gone astray while you're under the husband's authority, if you have defiled yourself or some other man or your husband has lain with you, then the priest shall put the woman under oath of the curse, and she shall say to the and he shall say to the woman, "The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people. When the Lord makes it, your thigh rot and your belly swell, and this may be uh, and and may this water that causes the curse go into your stomach and make your belly swell and your thigh rot. Then the woman shall say, Amen. So be it. And then the priest shall write the curses in a book, and he shall scrape them off into the bitter water, and he shall t make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse, and the water that brings the curse shall bring and enter her, her to become bitter. Then the priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, wave the offering before the Lord, and bring it to the altar. The priest shall then take the handful of, of the offering as it is a memorial portion and burn it on the altar, and afterward make the woman drink the water. When he has made her drink the water... It, she, um, if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully towards her husband, that the water brings a curse, will enter her and become bitter, and her belly will swell and her thigh will rot, and the woman will become a curse amongst her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and, it, and is clean, then she shall be free of any, uh, and she may conceive children. This is the law of jealousy then, uh, when a wife, uh, while under the husband's authority, goes astray and defiles her, or when a spirit of jealousy comes upon a man and he be jealous of his wife, then it shall stand before the woman and the Lord, and the priest shall execute the law upon her, and then the man shall be free of iniquity, and that woman will bear her guilt. Okay, so that was a lot. And any time it's said in there, uh, and her thigh will rot, um, what that tra it, the, the translation there is... Uh, a very soft translation, what it means is that she won't be able to conceive. That um, Some translations say that she'll miscarry. Um, and the question that keeps coming, and I've gotten this like a dozen times because of the whole Roe versus Wade thing, is, is this God performing abortions? Because this woman drinks this solution, and now it's causing her to miscarry. And um, what you need to understand here is this is not a solution or a potion, as some people called it. This is not a potion that causes abortions. 
what this is is a, you okay first of all drinking water with papyrus and uh, charcoal ink in it is not poisonous it will not poison you it will not make you not have babies it will, what this is is it's symbolic of judgment and the woman is standing before God, swearing before the altar that she did not cheat on her husband. And it's then allowing God to pass judgment on her. And some, some, things, uh, uh, some translations say her thigh will rot. Some translations say that uh, it will cause her to miscarry. Um, but the, the best translation, the most direct translation, would be the word barren. She would become barren. And then that's why if she is found in, uh, not guilty, then it says that she may conceive freely. See, it's not a formula for abortion in the Bible. Um, but I've, I've been seeing it all over Facebook that, as being said that. And I've actually had several people, you know, like I said, email me or a couple people. I was in the gun store the other day, and they were like, hey, we got this verse we need to ask you about. You know, I have more Bible studies in the gun store than I have almost anywhere else. Um, and, you know, um, but that's, and I, of course, I tell the owners too, and I hope you're listening, Bryce. If you come to church, you could ask the questions in church instead of the gun store. Um, yeah, he, he, never mind. Uh, I will pick on Bryce in person. I don't have to do it in front of the camera. Um, but I'll tag him in this post later so he can see. Anyway, but so I just wanted to, the, but the ultimate point of this is, is God passes judgment here. God is sovereign. It's God who says who is born and who does, is not born. And, and instead of this being a fight for abortion, it's actually a concept against abortion because the same God who says, I, I knit you together in the womb, is the same one that has the right to say whether a womb bears or not. And that's why you see uh, women that, that were barren that only through miracles were they able to conceive. That's because that is the purvey of God. It's not for the government to tell us yes or no. It's not, for, it's not a women's rights issue. It's a God life issue. And, and that's, it, it's all in the realm of God. And, and, and you know, I, as I talked to Liz a little bit on Sunday, it, the, the lie in all of this comes when people have convinced women that this is a women's rights issue and your rights are being taken away. And it's like, no, uh, when God said these things, this is, these are things that he set down in order to protect us. Um, you know, when, when a lot of people, and this is another issue that came up in the gun store the other day, is they were asking me about, you know, um, just how bad is fornication? And I'm like, why are we having this conversation? How bad is it? Just, just like on a scale of one to ten. No, uh, it's not God t trying to tell you that you shouldn't have fun. It's God trying to protect us from things. Um, you know, the, the unwanted pregnancy, God trying to protect us from, from, you know, think about it. If everybody only slept with their spouse and everybody was faithful with only their spouse, there would be no STDs, right? God is no, and no abortion and no anything. God is protecting us with some of these rules. Now, sure, it stops us from having fun. I mean, you've heard me say it before. If temptation was, if sin wasn't fun, then you're sinning wrong, Right? Because 90% of sin is fun. And temptation is hard to resist. We all know that. Uh, now, temptation is not sin unless you let it become sin. Because we know that Jesus himself was tempted. But um, we're adults. We should be able to say no. We should. And, and I'm not saying that it's easy. I mean, again, you all know I have a past. I was, I was not a good person for a long time. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to start this ministry, but I never got it going. It was called Keep Your Pants On. Mm. Because I felt like if we could just convince everybody to keep their pants on, they wouldn't have this whole issue. Well, and that's, um, you know, it, following several discussion threads in, in uh, uh, single ministry groups and stuff like that, it's amazing just how many people that think that one night stands should not be a sin that it, it's just like it's totally acceptable and and i mean i i get the idea behind it because i understand what lust feels like i mean it's it's fun to give into lust on the other side of that there's a reason why god made it a sin um 
you form emotional attachments that, that maybe you shouldn't have, or you pick up diseases, or you create children you didn't expect, or you're giving yourself to a person that's not going to be your spouse, and it becomes this big thing. Um, but um, the fact is, is we all have the right and the ability to say no. And that brings up the next, uh, and I got this question like nine or ten times this week, um, and I'll leave out most of the cuss words. Uh, actually, I'm going to leave out all the cuss words, but... Um, when it comes to rape, incest, the life of the mother, um, or a severely handicapped child, all four of those categories combined together make up less than 3% of all abortions in America. And so what that leaves us is 97% of them being used as birth control. Um, in, what is it, uh, 2019, a little over 600,000 abortions performed in the United States, not counting New York and California who refused to release the numbers. So we're looking at roughly a million, and if you go by the statistics then, 970,000 of those were for birth control, 30,000 of those were because of rape. And so um, that, that's another fallacy that's being put out there about the abortions and stuff like that, is, is it's not to protect that 3%. Um, that three percent is being used as sure. Well, yeah, and, 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 and I'm not even going to go that deep down that rabbit hole. What, what I'm going to stick with, though, is, is we understand that the, the morning after pill has only been, like, widely available for about the past 10 years. And that is something, if you absolutely have to have unprotected sex, the morning after pill is, like, 20 bucks. You can get it over the counter at CVS. And it stops the woman's body from producing an egg for several days. And so there is no, the, the egg is, there is no f fertilization. There is no life that begins and then gets sloughed off. Um, and that was another argument was that someone says, well, a lot of eggs that get fertilized never implant. And so the process of life has started and then it never continues. That's absolutely true. Um, and that absolutely is in the purvey of God. That, that, is, that falls under the guise of God designed the body, and God says who's born and who's not. Um, and so, again, it, it goes back into, we put things out, take things out of the hands. And so it, it's not about the woman, it's not about the man. Um, quite frankly, uh, even when I wasn't living with the Lord, for the Lord, um, I always felt it was a man's responsibility to, A, provide protection, and B, if something happened, to take care of the woman and the child, because that's what a man does. Um, I don't understand these parents that are out there, both men and women, that refuse to take care of their children or refuse to see their children. Or I, I don't, that, that's mind-boggling to me. I don't, there's nothing in me that grasps that at all. Because um, I think about all the, the, the parents that don't get to see their kids that fight and fight and fight just for a few hours with their kids. And so, uh, um, yeah, it just, it just blows my mind. Uh, when parents were like that. So anyway, that's, um, I, I, I think I've answered a, a wide range of questions that I've, I've received, but that, I was inundated with emails this week about that. Um, and then the other thing about the holy water. How come we don't have holy water in the church? That's a great Sunday school answer, but it's wrong. No, it's uh, the water of the life, a water of life, and everything. Why don't we, as as Protestants, yeah, right? But I mean, here here we have it in the Bible. They were using holy water. It says holy water here. Why don't we? Why didn't we continue that tradition? 
Go ahead. You, you actually, you were on part of the right path, though, but. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, what, that's where you were going with it, right? Okay. But I can't sprinkle living water on anybody. I can't make this thing. I can't fight vampires because I don't have holy water. How would you make holy water? There you go. Okay, how was holy water made, and why don't we have it? Well, the reason we don't have it is because there are two sets of rules in the Bible. One for all people, that's the law of sin, and then there was the law for just the Jewish nation that set them apart as the Jewish people, and only Levitical priests could make holy water through a certain blessing ritual. That's why we don't literally have holy water. The Catholic priests try to kind of copy that in their process, but it, they're not Levitical priests and it doesn't fit. And after the coming of Christ, um, all that stuff was what, and, and what did, but God never takes something away without giving us something better. And what did God give us something better? He gave us the Holy Spirit, which is represented by the oil. Now, do you know what makes this oil holy? Nothing. This is not holy oil. This is... Olive oil, and why do we use olive oil? Because it's a little bit more traditional because olive oil was what they, what they made back in the day in Jesus' time because that's the kind of oil that was available. You know, if they, were, if they were in central United States when Jesus and all that happened, you know what they would use? Canola oil because that's what we make here. But you know what makes this special? We put a little bit of myrrh in there to make it smell good. <laughs> It's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. It ha the oil has no power. I can pray for you and you can be healed. You can pray for you and be healed without the oil. The oil is symbolic of inviting the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to make sure that we don't put our faith into ritual or into symbolic things. It's just like, you know, um, when Notre Dame was on fire. I mean, here's this great, beautiful structure. It's on fire. And they tasked two fire companies to go inside and pull out certain artifacts that were deemed more valuable than the entire structure of Notre Dame. They were willing to risk the life of 22 firefighters to save the Shroud of Turin, to save the supposed finger bone of the Apostle Paul. Um, and because these are holy relics. You know how much power is in a relic? Exactly. The God you worship has power. Jesus Christ, we have power through him. This is symbolic. Now, the Bible tells us that we should anoint people with oil in symbolic of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we do that out of obedience, inviting the Holy Spirit's presence into it. But we don't do it because the oil has power. We don't, we don't use holy water because it has power. The, the water that we baptize you with up here, when, for all of y'all that don't know, we, our baptismal is under the stage. Um, we move the pulpit and we have a lid there and it comes out. But you know what? That water is so holy and special that we use it for when it's done. We water the front yard with it because there's a hose that runs right out there. <laughs> eh, why waste the water? This is Texas. Yes, ma'am. It is a mindset. Yeah, it, it's a man-made thing. It's a tradition that has come up primarily through the Catholic Church. Um, and, it, and it's become, you know, because they were very into symbols. And symbols are very powerful things. But it's just, it, it was very symbolic. It's just symbolic. And, you know, um, we baptize submersion because that's what the Bible shows us to do. But when that gentleman up in Thornton only had a short period of time to live and he was unable to get out of his bed, I, first time I've ever done a sprinkle baptism, I took a sponge full of water because he wanted baptized. He accepted Christ. He got baptized and died 45 minutes later. Um, his baptism was no less than yours. Because it was a baptism in faith. It was a public confession of, the f of faith. And that's what baptism is. And we are going to be having a baptismal service um, at the end of July. Um, pe several people have been asking me when we're going to be having our next baptismal service. Uh, it is, I believe, the, the last Sunday of July. I will have to double check. It's either the second to last or the last. I have to double check our, our calendar. But so that's what will be coming up in July is, is baptism Sunday. Um, and, uh, and for everyone that 
and I always get this question. If you have children that want to be baptized, uh, we do not baptize infants. Um, we don't baptize small children. Um, we dedicate those to the Lord just as, as um, Samuel was presented to the Lord and dedicated to the Lord. We wait until a child is old enough to understand the gospel. And for every child, that's a different age. And basically, if they're anyone under about 12, they're going to have to sit down in my office and they're going to have it to explain salvation to me. Uh, or we, we will dedicate them rather than baptize them. Um, and that's just because you see a lot of people that are baptized as children and then come back and get baptized as adults because they're like, well, I didn't really understand it. I was doing it more because mom wanted me to. Um, Elijah's asked me to be baptized several times, but he has not been fully able to explain baptism to me or, or uh, baptism or salvation to me. And, and uh, he, he's, he's very upset because I won't baptize him. Um, I look forward to the day I get to baptize him, but uh, it, will, it will be uh, a little bit because, you know, I want, it, I want it to be a full decision of what he is doing. Um, qualifications for baptism, since that's always a question that comes up. So how many years do you have to be a Christian in order to be baptized? None, right. What? Usually it's a, you can accept Christ and be baptized that day. Um, yeah, usually that's, that's a, kind of the best way to do it because you, know, you kill two birds with one stone. That public confession of your faith then helps solidify the decision you've made in Jesus Christ. And that's what it is. Because the Bible says if you um, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you, you shall be saved. Well, that's a public confession of your faith. And, and, and so I think that that's, a, a, that's an awesome thing to get done as quickly as possible. Um, but you don't have to wait a certain number of times. You don't have to uh, be a Christian a certain number of years. You do not have to be a, a legal standing member of this church. If you are a, have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I will dunk you under that water. And for the more sin in your life, the longer I hold you under. No. Um, but uh, it just, you know, we, uh, I have not drowned anybody yet. I, well, it's a yet. I almost, we, we almost lost one girl, but um, I was baptizing in a river in Montana, and she was like 90 pounds, and it was flood season, and she was insisting on the river. And we had two people standing downstream, because sure enough, as she went under, as she came back up, she foot slipped on the rocks, she went out of my hands, and downriver. But we had two guys standing about five feet downriver, and they caught her. So, uh, rivers in Montana flow a little faster than the rivers in Texas. Just, yeah. Um, I almost, and man, the water was like 35 degrees. It was, it was like it's spring runoff. It was cold. I mean, the water we were in was like snow the day before. It was, it was, it was very unpleasant. We baptized like 12 people that day. I was numb from the waist down. It was like... I baptize you in the name of Jesus. Everybody thought I had the Holy Ghost. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Sometimes I just should not speak, you know? Then yeah, nobody would forget that day. But anyway, moving forward. Um, the other question that I had is... Does the Bible make any reference, and then I'll get to questions in the room. Sorry, I just am answering all the questions since I had so many come in this week online. Does the Bible make reference to aliens as in non-earthling types? Uh, no. Now, in the aliens, yes. It says that we are strangers and aliens. We are not of this world. When we accept Christ, we, we become not of this world. But it does not make reference from visitors from other planets coming to this planet and helping build the pyramids, things of that nature. Um, and that's actually, uh, you know, because I think the History Channel right now is running several uh, alien shows, um, and they're, they're doing the whole pyramid thing over again. Um, and one question you've got to ask yourself, if, if you're thinking about that, is if an advanced species has all the technology to fly all the way across the universe in order to build a landing pad here on Earth, wouldn't you think that that landing pad would be a little bit more technologically advanced than a block of limestone? Or a bunch of blocks of limestone stacked on top of each other? I mean... Okay. That spiritual beings. Those, the, yeah. The Bible calls them spirit. They're, they're not... Yeah. Right. But... They are not referenced to coming from planet Zeblon or, or something like that. Um, they, they are not, and, and we're told that they are spirit beings. They are not, um, you know, 
that, yeah. And so, uh, and because that's a question that comes up a lot. And then the other question that, that comes up along with it is what happens at the end of time. When the entire universe is wiped out, if there are literally species on millions of planets all across the universe, and God speaks the entire universe out of existence except for the new heaven and the new earth and the holy city sitting on that, what happens to all those other species? Is it just a God zoo or something, and he's just okay with getting rid of it? See, this is, this is, there's some, some problems when we start trying to bring other alien races into this, where the end times with that addresses what happens with the angels and the demons at that point. Yeah, the lake of fire, right? And, and, but the Bible talks about what happens to demonic or, or angelic beings for all eternity. But little gray men living on other planets are never, is never addressed by Scripture. Um, and so and I, I would suggest that, that more than likely they don't exist based on the fact that if that happened then, where would Satan, would now Satan get to travel to each planet, trying to corrupt each planet? Would Jesus have to then go and die on each planet? How does all that work? Um, does everybody, were we the only ones that got corrupted? You know, there's just, there's a lot involved there. And, and that, again, that's up to God. Um, but biblically, there are not any direct references to little gray men, little green men. Um, the, you know, the, the, temp, the, the, Pyramids were uh, a miracle when you think about how they were built, um, but when you have a million slaves, it gets easier. You know, and that's and that's really the the final answer on that is is they have the quarries where the rocks were cut. They they have I mean even in some of the etchings on some of the 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 Egyptian stuff that there is shows them pushing. The, the big limestone rocks on logs and stuff like that. It wasn't, you know, beaming mint went over and it wasn't, you know, it's not referenced anywhere. So anyway, moving beyond that. Questions from the room instead of the internet. I got it, man. This week was like a load of questions for, from everybody online. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of fake history being taught in science courses. Um, you know, when, when you look at the history of the world biblically compared to the history of the world um, uh, in science classes. And then, uh, yeah, you know, there's... Um, I, you know, it, without knowing his specific issues, it's kind of hard to address that. Uh, we know that our public schools are indoctrinating our children against the truth of the gospel. And that's, that's why on Sunday I was talking about that. You know, we need to be educating our children. We need to be teaching them the truth of things. Um, you know, my, my son, he's getting a little obnoxious with it. Um, like, I, I, like, I like spaceship shows. I like uh, Star Wars, Star Trek, all this kind of stuff. And we were watching Stargate the other day, and they were doing the whole alien pyramids thing. And he's like, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lot. Shut up, boy. I'm trying to watch the show, you know? You now, I appreciate the fact that he understands creation and he understands that kind of stuff. And, and I love the, but he, he's getting a little bit, per, he's taking it personal now. Um, I, I've got to start finding a balance for the poor kid. Um, yeah, and uh, we, we, we started watching, uh, I think it was Captain Marvel the other day. And he's like, no, uh-uh. You know, the only thing he likes, and he's like his dad, he likes Captain America because that, during that one show when Thor jumps out of the plane and he's going to fight uh, Iron Man and Captain America is going to go down and settle it. The girl says, you probably shouldn't do that. He's kind of a god. And Captain America says to him, there's only one god, ma'am, and I'm sure he doesn't dress like that. And, uh, you know, and he jumps out of the plane and goes down and, and fights both Thor and Captain America. And um, Elijah loves that line because he's like, yeah, see, he told you Thor's not a god. Huh? It's like, yes, we know Thor's not a god. Shut up. Watch the show. Um, He's a, Z, he's a zealot. What can I say? I love my son. Uh, but anyway, so questions. 
Charlie. You got two, okay. Sure. Yep. Yep. Chapter one, verse eighteen. Right. Love you, Charlie. Okay, for the camera, I've got to repeat the question. Uh, the question is: um, Zechariah in in Luke chapter one, the angel comes to him and says, "Your wife is going to be with a uh, child," and he's like, "How's that going to happen? I'm too old for this to happen." And uh, but he knows about Abraham, and he knew that Abraham and Sarah had kids. Sarah was eighty, and uh, Abraham was a hundred. Um, and so, how's this going to happen? And and so the the question. Uh, you know, and because of that, he was struck mute until uh, he said that, you know, that when, well, until the baby was born. So for, for nine months. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I so worry about you guys, whatever you said. I don't want to know. Um, let, let, let me get to this question then. We'll, okay. Um, so what about us? The question is, what about us? What, it, what when we don't believe in God? Well, first of all, we have all these examples to trust God, right? We have all these examples to know that God is, is faithful. And so when God promises us something, we should trust him. Um, but what happens to us? Charlie's concerned that his socks didn't match for two months because he was not living in faith. Um, I can't, I, yeah, I don't think your sock drawer is God's biggest concern. More than likely, it would be something directly related to what's going on there. Um, but I want them to believe that unless, unless Gabriel comes and stands in front of you and ta talks about it, I'm willing to bet that you could just go ahead and count a little bit of grace. Okay? Now, ma'am, go ahead. Well, yeah. Um, and, and he knows the birds of the baby. But if you look back on Abraham and Sarah... When God is speaking to Sarah and tells her that she's going to have a baby and she laughed and he's like, why did you laugh? And she's like, I didn't laugh. He's like, okay, first of all, God, um, so I know you laughed. And second of all, I heard you laugh. So, and she's like, well, how is it going to happen? Well, I know the pleasure of my Lord one more time, speaking of her husband. He is very old. So, you know, sister girl's going, hey, Viagra has not been invented yet and homeboy's 100 years old. And God's like, I'm God, it's going to happen. Um, but, but she had a legit question, right? And, I mean, the people in the Bible are people, right? They're, they're human. They, they have the same doubts, they have the same fears we do, and, they, and the same understandings. And she understood that Abraham was 100, was 100 years old, and, and there was going to be some difficulty in getting this done. And uh, God's like, yeah, y'all are going to be okay. Trust me, you know? It's like some roses, a little bit of wine. We're, we're going to make this happen. And, I mean, we don't know what happened, but... She ended up with a baby. And, uh, and so babies were made in the same way then as they were there. And so we know that Zechariah, when he went home, he went home and, and didn't apparently talk to his wife about it. But somehow, because he couldn't speak, so, but somehow she got the message. Because nine months later, there was a baby. So, you know, sometimes you guys ask me the weirdest questions and I get in trouble with the answers. Um... <laughs> So, yeah, we, we end up with, with this happening, and, and uh, I don't know if God does. I, I would say that, yes, in some cases they do, and, and referencing back to the pastor that I studied under, um, when, when I was uh, an associate pastor down in Copper's Cove, um, there were some things that God had told him to do, and 
in arrogance is his own description of it, in, his, in pride, he knew better than God, and so he didn't do those things. And God took his voice. Um, the only time he could speak was when he stepped into the pulpit. He would literally, he could barely talk like this. But the second he stepped into the pulpit, he had full booming voice. And because he was one of those really loud preachers, right? And that's how he preached all the time. And he had full voice. As second he said amen, stepped out of the pulpit, he had no voice for almost two months. Um, until he repented, not only to God, but to the church, because now his sin was public. And had to tell them what he had not done. And so he had to publicly repent and then make it right. And, and, um, and as soon as he did, voice came back and he had voice from then on out. Um, now, that doesn't mean that every time the pastor sins, he has to re publicly repent to y'all because we just don't have time for that. Um, I'm, yeah, sorry, y'all. <sighs> but anyway... Um, you know, that's, so I, I would say in some cases, God does that. In other cases, I would say most cases, there's grace. And that God deals with us on the one-on-one, -on -one and he just, you know, allows us to get it right with him. And that's, and the Bible says that he, he uh, disciplines those that he loves. And, and so, you know, we, we come under the hand of discipline, and, and then we repent for it, and he fixes it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, if, if you're not hearing from God, if you're not fully understanding, he is going to do things to help your understanding. Um, and if the angel Gabriel appears to you and starts speaking to you, shut up and listen and don't argue. I think that's the lesson that we've learned here, right? Don't argue. Um, how's this going to happen? Don't question it. Now, you notice Mary asked the same question, though, and God was good with, God was a lot more graceful with her. She's like, well, how, how is this going to happen since I've never known a man? And, uh, you know, the angel was just like, well, God's going to take care of this. Don't, don't worry about it. And so he, he, she was given much more grace than Zechariah was given. Um, so I'm going, guessing, case-by-case case basis, especially since he was a priest in the house of the Lord, and, and he... Uh, yeah, he, he, well, he was inside doing the offering so that he was in the high priest realm, you know, and so he should have known better. And when you've got an angel standing there talking to you, you should believe that. But you notice how many people in the Bible don't. Think about Gideon. Gideon had an angel stood before him, and he still had to do the whole thing with the staff and the food, and then, then the fleece getting wet, and then the, the barley loaf dream that happened later. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and read the story of Gideon. It's only two chapters long. Um, but all those things he had to have to reassure his faith. And yet he's still mentioned in Hebrews 11, the heroes of faith. So it's amazing what God can do with the weakest of us. Next question. You want to answer your other one before I jump across the aisle? Or? Yes, ma'am. Right. Oh, so you're saying that Mary was a better person than Zechariah? This is, you, you don't like men? Is that what I'm hearing? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. God, God judges the heart. And, yet, and you got to figure, Mary was probably a lot more scared about the situation than Zechariah was as well. She was like, yeah, 13, 14 years old, and she was a non-married woman facing, okay, wait a minute, I'm going to be pregnant, and I'm not married? So she had a lot more... Uh, a heavier thing coming against her, because I mean, they could have put her to death. Joseph could have taken her out in the town square and had her stoned to death, you know. Um, but the Bible says that he was an honorable man, that he was just going to quietly put her away. And isn't that interesting that even though they weren't married, but because they were promised to each other, he was still going to have to divorce her? But he stepped up and took responsibility of, of the, the woman and the baby and, yeah. and moved forward. And... Uh, Another kind of poignant point to our culture today. It's a good lesson we should pay attention to. That's the truth of that. <sighs> Question. Sure.
Yeah, um, it, they, he stops talking about, uh, talking to him by name at the, at the end there. And, and Okay, the question is, in the book of Job, if, if you're not familiar with the story of Job, Job is this really rich guy, and Satan um, comes and just strips Job of everything he's got. Kids, camels, sheep, servants, everybody's taken. The only thing Job is left with is basically a knockdown house and a wife going, why don't you just curse God and die? So, um, you know, the thorn in his side, God said, no, you're going to pluck that out. You're going to stay married. And, uh, um, and you got to understand Job's wife, though. I mean, she just lost all of her kids. She has a right to be a little bit upset, right? I mean, she, she's hurting. She's, she's scared. She gets a bad rap in the story of Job, I think. Um, and if Job was any sort of spiritual leader in his household, he would have enriched her faith long before they got to that point. But we're not going there. Um, so anyway, his three friends come. And you got to figure that these are his friends because they sit quietly and do not speak a word for seven days. They fast in ashes and sackcloth for seven days with him, and then at the end of that seven days, they start to accuse him of wrongdoing. And then they do it for like 30 chapters. And uh, um, at the end, God shows up, and he starts questioning Job, and then he turns to Job's friends. And why doesn't the third friend get mentioned? Four friends, four friends. Why doesn't the fourth friend get mentioned? It's at the end, there's three that the, the, are named, and then there's the fourth that is not. Don't know why that one's not mentioned. There's no explanation for it. I mean, I, I could read uh, some, some commentaries on it and stuff and see if someone addresses that, but um, in anything I've studied, that, that question's never come up. So yet again, you ask me questions that I cannot answer, sir. I appreciate you so much. Um... No, I, and honestly, I, I've never even thought about that. Even the dozen times or so I've read the story, I've never thought about that. But you're right. It doesn't mention the, the fourth friend there. Um, maybe he went home. Maybe uh, God didn't mention him because it's like, you know what? You are so much of a jerk. I'm going to address these guys, and we're just going to assume that you get lumped in there. I don't know. Um, what I do like is that when, because they have accused Job, and not fairly, for 30 chapters, when God is done setting Job straight, um, God turns to his friends and says, you know what, unless Job prays for you, y'all are done. And you notice that God does that periodically. Uh, in, in, uh, in Moses, um, you know, when Miriam was speaking against him, and she, God gave her leprosy, it's like, you know what, unless Moses prays for you, you're done. I, I'm not, and there's several other places in the Bible where, where God does that, where, and, and that's a, one of the things that I like about God in, in his bringing about justice and us not having to defend ourselves is that if we allow it and we allow him to do it in his time, God will justify us. God will step up and defend us where, where it's necessary. And, and even so, in these cases, these people were then having to turn to the person they had been mean to, going, would you please pray for us? Because, like, Miriam, God's like, I'm not going to heal you your leprosy unless Moses prays for you. And, uh, um, and so, yeah, Job had to pray for his friends uh, so that God would not kill them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, of course he recognized her. It was his sister. Um, no. Um, no, but you, you do. A, a lot. Of, she gets a really bad rap, but I just think that, that that's... Uh, uh, she, she, I mean, she just lost all of her kids. I mean, woman is distraught. She's seen everything in her world torn away. And she's a mother that just lost all of her children. I think, I think that that's, uh, she, she, she probably has a right to be a little bit unhappy. And, uh, but anyway, um, okay, this is, sorry, I thought I had a question that had just come in. And uh, um, uh, it's not a question. Someone's trying to teach my kids how to make Mexican candy. I get weird emails, y'all. What can I say? It's like, hey, I think your son would like to do this as a project. Okay, thank you.
Um, but any other questions? We still have 10 minutes left. Oh, I thought you were done already. Oh, sweet. Revelation. Okay, is the book of Revelation in chronological order is the ultimate question. Um, yes and no. But you've got to figure out, first of all, the first three chapters were written to churches that existed in the day. Um, and so first three chapters are not prophecy. They, are, they were directed at existing people. Then after that, what you, you begin a, a, a time period, but because... Um, see, like right now, in Washington, D.C., something's happening, right? Right now, in California, something's happening. Um, right now, in Montana, the weather's beautiful, and I wish I was there. Um, so, but, now, I can't tell you all four of those events at the same time, especially if I'm writing it down. I have to write down the, what the weather's like in Montana, California, and I have to do it separately, right? Well, so, if I'm at counting, saying there's seven things going on at one time, I'm going to have to tell you those seven things in a row. That I'm not putting out a timeline. I'm putting out things that are happening at the same time or possibly overlapping in time. And so what you have in the book of Revelation is you have a seesaw effect. And then you see this actually in a lot of Hebrew-style writing where they'll start out and they'll tell a story and then they'll back up like halfway and then they'll tell it in more detail and bring out more items that were happening at the same time and then they'll back up again and be like, okay, and then while this was happening, there's also this going on. And then, you know, and, and so you have this seesaw effect and what it is is actually a musical style um, the, of ancient, uh, or a poetic style, more of a musical style, but a, a poetic style of the ancient Hebrews. Um, you see that when uh, Moses wrote about creation. You see the very factual, practical explanation, and then he backs up and he tells the whole story over again with much more detail. And you see him back up over himself a couple of different times in the creation story. Um, and, and, and with Moses, the way Moses writes, Moses is very distinct in what he does. And so you know when he's saying a historical thing, when you know when he's saying an allegorical thing. And, and so when he was writing in Genesis, he told two stories of creation that overlapped each other, but they were both very factual in this style. When Moses writes poetic, you know that he's writing poetic. And, and actually he wrote some of uh, the, the Psalms. And it's because he was very different, and, and he learned that as a prince in Egypt. He learned how to write in different styles. And that the Egyptian culture, or the Hebrew culture developing primarily while they were in Egypt, adopted a lot of that same writing styles and the same educational formats. And then you see John adopting that in Revelation, and because he is going back and forth trying to get everything pinned into this seven-year tribulation. He's like, okay, now this is all happening, and then, well, and then we're going to stop here, and we're going to pause, and everybody's going to take a breath, and he even talks about how there's silence in heaven for a minute, and then we're going to, yeah. and a lot of times that that's, at, that's when you know a new timeline has begun. It's like, okay, so we've done this for a couple of years, and now, okay, we've got to go back, we've got to go back, and you're, okay, then there's a pause, and now we're going to overlap, and then he goes back, and he tells on a whole new thing. And uh, you'll, you'll see it. And, and it's, 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 uh, if you study the different uh, writing styles of the different authors of the Bible, um, you'll see that that's a, a pretty common theme, especially in the ones that were more uh, formally he Hebraically uh, trained. Um, and so, yeah, that's why Hebrew uh, Revelation, you can't say, yes, it's all just chronologically laid out. Um, I've heard some preachers preach it that way, but the problem is, is you stretch uh, the, the, the last seven years into about 21 years um, in order to fit everything in in the way that the Bible describes it. So, I hope that made sense. Okay. 
Five minutes left. Any other questions? Go ahead. You got another, you must have another question I can't answer. Yeah, I can help you find an LPC sticker afterwards. Yeah, it's no problem. See? I, I answered that question. Um, they've not been ordered yet, so yeah. Uh, the probably this Sunday is the last Sunday to sign up for shirts. Um, if you have not received an LPC T-shirt, they are free for your first one. If you want more than one, it's ten dollars after that. Um, if you've already received a free one in a previous year, then it's ten dollars this year. Um, and so the, I think I have the sign-up sheets here. We're going to get those ordered probably this upcoming week, so that we have them available to us for National Night Out. So they should be in before National Night Out. If everything follows the pattern that has always followed, then they won't show up until the day of National Night Out. Do you have the gift of the Holy Spirit in this time? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, the Bible talks about the gifts, and, and yes, we, the gifts function freely here. Um, but we do it... Uh, how much of, do I say here? Um, there are a lot of churches, a lot of Pentecostal churches that do Pentecost in the exact opposite way the Bible talks about. Um, there are things Paul said, this should never happen, and yet you see it happening, and we call it powerful. And so um, we're very biblical about how we function in, in the power of the Holy Spirit. There are people that speak in tongues. We have that in interpretation and, and things like that. It doesn't happen nearly as often as, as you, you see it, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, and, and like and we actually uh, we just had a, a speaker in that spoke on it uh, for three days, um, and uh, some people were curious as to his style versus my style. Um, he, him being who he is, he's very loud. You hear him praying in tongues a lot. When unless you're standing right next to me and I'm praying for you, you probably don't hear me praying in tongues because I don't have the gift of prophecy. And no one's going to interpret what I say because what I'm saying is m most of the time if you hear me praying in tongues, especially when I'm praying with someone, it's because I don't know what to pray about. And I'm waiting for God to tell me. And, my and the Holy Spirit is communing with my spirit in order to tell me that. I don't have the gift of prophecy. And so you're not going to hear me pre speaking in tongues over the microphone unless I've forgotten to turn it off. Um, which I double check before prayer times because I don't, if you come forward for prayer, that's between you and God and I'm just the intermediary and, you know, you, it doesn't need to be on the loudspeakers. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very proper in the way that I pursue things with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, um, and that's, I loved uh, Marshall Windsor, the three sermons he preached because um, it was all very biblical. And that was a, a big deal to me. Uh, um, cultural Pentecostal bothers me. Because cultural Pentecostal has become very much about the show. Biblical Pentecostal is very much about us growing our relationship with God and us advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm, I'm very, very, if anything, if any legalism is in me, that, that's where you're going to find it. Is if, it's, if, if, if it goes against scripture, then it's not of God. The Bible is absolute. Okay, two minutes left. One minute left. The sound booth. Or you could put it on an offering envelope and write T-shirt and drop it in the, in, the, in the offering on Sunday. So, um, and we do have if you if we do have some of the red, white, and blue uh, T-shirts left over from last year. If anyone wants to buy those, there's are ten bucks. They're in the prayer room. Um, <clears throat> that they were the black ones with the red, white, and blue logo. Uh, this year will be either just charcoal or black, and it'll be a white logo. Because um, they're, they're still having problems getting, you remember last year we had problems getting some of the colors because of all the supply chain? They're still having problems with some of the t-shirts and stuff on that. So uh, we're going very simple this year. But anyway, let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you uh, once again for the people that are here. We ask that your hand would be on those that are traveling. And, and Lord, this weekend, um, again, with, with the fires and people traveling and the holidays, Lord, we just ask that your hand of protection would remain upon us. Lord, we, we, uh, we come together, Lord, to learn about you, to gain greater knowledge of you, not just for our own selves, but, Lord, so that we can share your gospel with this town and with this county and with, with this world. And we just ask, Father, that you would empower us to do this, embolden us. Lord, in the, in the areas we don't have knowledge, grow our knowledge. Give us a hunger and a desire to read your word more. 
And Lord, I just ask that you would uh, continue to bless the people of this church and continue to bless the work that we're doing. And we thank you, Lord God, for allowing us to serve you in this community. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. It's still warm in here anyway, isn't it?